So um, today I'm going to meet Caitlin English, who's the acting state coroner, and she's going to um, she's going to take me through the courts and um, take me through her role and, and and what they get up to during the day. And I'm going to find out about an inquest, who comes, what it's about, what's the end result, hopefully. <laughs> The thing to note is only a very small portion of cases go to a hearing. Right, yes, um, yes. You will get the same quality of um, investigation in, an, in a, what we call a chamber's finding. Um, so the, the investigation's all done sort of without having a hearing. The hearing is for, for 95 plus particular percent purposes. of cases are finalised in that manner. In that manner. Yeah, well, well, more, I think yeah. it is. Yeah. More, yeah. probably, yeah. yeah. I think about yeah. It's very two to three percent, I think. The general way is either we've got a natural cause death, like I said, 40 percent, so that they can be closed usually quite quickly with some medical records potentially being looked at, or if we've got a really early cause of death, um, so we can close them quite quickly. And then we've also got the coronial brief, which is requested, so that is prepared usually by Vic Pole. So, when you say coronial brief, yep. what do you mean exactly? What do you so, that is gathering evidence for the coroner to make further either directions or determinations or findings. So mm. it's it's basically usually statements, exhibits, so photographs, um, statements from witnesses or family members of the deceased um, and um, anything, the coroner can do a directed brief so they can ask for specifics like I want the treating practitioner to, to do a statement of the care given on the day or, or, or lead, leading up to death but usually it's trying to ascertain the circumstances around the death. Um, and obviously to underpin the cause of death and mm. prevention opportunities as mm. well. So mm -hmm. we do everything at the direction of the coroner. Right. Um, so uh, we, if, if the coroner notice, knows early on what they want to do, they will direct the case in that, in that way. So they might say, um, you know, it's a suicide and I want to get a brief to get some information or, or it appears to be a suicide mm. and I want to get a brief to, to, to sort of underpin that finding of suicide. Um, there's also the um, the direction that can come later. So we, might, we, we often wait for the medical examination report which is provided by the pathologist. That can take some time to come in uh -huh. and once we get that we've got a lot more information to work with. So um, cause of death is, is on there. Um, anything like toxicology results. So um, a fantastic case that came about was, well it wasn't fantastic, but um, a very interesting case is we had a, a deceased come in and, and it appeared to be natural causes and through the toxicology results we were able to determine that it was carbon monoxide poisoning. The release happens right sort of with, as early as possible. Uh -huh. So as soon as any procedure if, um, on the body needs, has, been, has occurred, so any testing, autopsy, um, uh, there could be extra testing for neurological purposes or, or whatever. Um, as soon as they're completed and we have a senior next of kin that's, that's sort of arranged a funeral um, director so where we can take the body to, it happens really quickly. Right. We do not, yeah, we yeah. would not have bodies here for that. Oh, period of time and, yeah, and, yeah. But then, and then the case continues and yes yep yes yep yeah, yeah. so as soon as the body's released I guess this the coronial missions and inquiries role is is kind of finished in that sense mm -hmm. and then it carries over to the registry and um, and the rest of the court to undertake the, the rest of the, the yeah. um, processes for the coroner yeah yeah there's uh, 35,000 deaths in Victoria I believe, um, and of those, between six and a half and seven thousand are reported to the coroner. Maybe closer to the six and a half thousand, mm. um, and then breaking that down, forty percent of those are usually um, natural cause deaths, or nat deaths of natural causes, and um, thirty percent are accidents. So that can cover um, road vehicle accidents, um, workplace accidents. So accidental deaths, 10% mm -hmm. um, of suicides and 
we have about, I think it's about seven or eight percent that are medical um, deaths. Right. So, yeah. and then there's obviously um, other causes Very few as well. Homicides, which is I think it's about one or one percent. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. Homicides are investigated usually by, um, or, or if there's a perpetrator that's known, they they go through a criminal proceeding. So, so the coroner has nothing to do with the homicide case. They they do. They yes. they absolutely do. But um, as Coroner Byrne was saying earlier, that he would a coroner would usually allow the criminal proceedings to be finalised before a coroner looks at that investigation. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But the process here at, um, of doing the autopsy, making directions around autopsy and all of that occurs through the coroner as and well. That, and that helps the criminal investigation and then it goes yeah. back. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, you're an independent judicial officer who investigates reportable deaths to the extent that you think a particular matter warrants investigation. Some are extensive, some are not. And you objectively uh, assess that evidence and come to a finding, and by a finding I mean the facts surrounding that death. And I usually do it by way of a little process of a little background, uh, so broad circumstances of the death, this is the finding. Mm -hmm. The report to the coroner, the further investigation, the conclusions and the finding. You, didn't, you, st you gather all the evidence you think is necessary for a particular matter, examine it carefully and come to some views as to the facts surrounding the death. That's mm -hmm. the primary role in my view. So there's three aspects of whether a death is um, reportable to the court. There's a definition in Section 4 of the Coroner's Act. There's three aspects and the three aspects relate to, first of all, the relationship that the person has with Victoria, so a jurisdictional nexus, whether they lived here or usually lived here or their body is in Victoria. Uh, second of all, it's the type of death, so is it an unnatural and unexpected or a violent death or is it a death that's resulted as a um, either directly or indirectly as a result of accident or injury. Um, and then there's those deaths that are also reportable where they've occurred either um, during or after a medical procedure where a registered medical practitioner wouldn't have expected that death. So they're the types of deaths. And then the third category relates to the type of person who has died and if they are immediately prior to their death in custody or care. Um, those deaths are also reportable, which recognises the special duty that the state owes to people who are coercively detained, that their deaths are independently um, examined. Well, the Victorian Coroner's Court was set up in 2008 um, and it established the Coroner's Court as the first specialist inquisitorial court in Australia. And the coroner's court in Victoria is unique in a number of aspects. Firstly, we are centralised so that all the coroners are together here at the coroner's court. And secondly, all the coroners are specialists. So whether they're magistrates who are assigned to the coroner's court or coroners who are appointed um, on a five year term, they are all specialists and they do coronial work every day. And I think that gives enormous strength to the um, role of the coroner in Victoria, which makes it quite unique. Um, the other aspect, I think, of the coroner's court that makes it quite unique is the recommendations and commentary um, power of the court. So, and it really does it, it represent an intersection between um, the policy and the law, so that whilst most judicial officers will be doing um, individual cases and indeed coroners um, determine and make findings on individual cases, it's quite often that those cases will have a broader impact on the um, general Victorian community and by making rec recommendations and comments um, coroners have a role in uh, reducing the number of preventable deaths. About 40% of cases reported to the coroner's quarter from natural causes, and by and large, the majority of those cases are closed very quickly. So within a number of months, um, within three months, and that's about 40% of our cases. So occasionally there will be natural causes deaths which require more investigation. Um, the time that a case takes to investigate really depends a lot about the circumstances of the case. 
and the nature of the investigation that takes place. Um, the court is minded of the fact that um, the Coroner's Act requires that we don't duplicate our investigations and that we liaise with other investigation agencies um, in order not to duplicate and also to expedite our findings. So often the delay in a coroner's case will be as a result of another um, investigation proceeding. For example, if it's a homicide case, then the coronial um, process will take place after that has concluded. And the same with WorkSafe and other investigations. Um, in terms of the investigation, though, it might well be that if it's a medical matter, then the coroner will ask for the assistance of um, the coroner's prevention unit to actually uh, investigate whether or not um, there were any prevention opportunities to the death. And that might be as a result of the circumstances of the death, or it might well be that a family member has raised concerns. Uh, and it, if, a ca if a case ends up going to inquest, whereby it's a court hearing because the forensic um, processes of the court are required to examine the evidence, well then it could take um, a considerable longer, longer time. Um, and if there's um, ec other experts or expert reports that need to be obtained or um, further investigation, it's really you know, hard to, I suppose, um, give a general estimate of how long a case will take. But there's always the, um, the tension between wanting to expedite a case um, taking into account the sensitivities for families and not wanting to cause um, uh, undue distress by the length of time an investigation takes, but also then making sure that um, the case is, the death is investigated as it needs to be to fulfil our statutory requirements and the public interest aspect of our investigation, obviously, because a single death may have much more significant implications for um, a larger group of people. Less than 1% of our cases go to inquest, but if they do go to inquest, this is where they're held or in one of the other courts. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And who sits in all these seats? Well, the coroner sits at the back. You've got the comfy seat, yeah, of that's course, right. yeah. Beneath the crest. <laughs> uh, the barristers and solicitors will sit here at the bar table. Right. Uh, over here we have the witness box for the witnesses. Right. And how come there's four, four seats, three mics? Well, very occasionally in our cases, we might have a need for concurrent evidence, which means that um, we might have a number of experts who will give evidence at the same time. Oh, right. Yeah. So, they'll all, so they'll all sort of cross-reference each other. Well, what, it's an interesting process. It's colloquially called hot tubbing. Yeah. <laughs> but what in fact happens is that all the experts get together before um, uh, they actually come into court. They're asked to answer about 10 questions and then they nominate a spokesperson and then they come into court and their spokesperson will speak on their behalf. But if the other experts perhaps don't agree, they'll ah. uh, chip in their point of view and then they'll be asked questions by the coroner and also by the barristers. barristers. Mm. So you, you said just 1% of cases come here. So what's particular about those cases? Why, why do they end up here? Well, we have about 6,500 cases reported to the court every year. Um, the cases that come to inquest are usually those cases that require some forensic examination of the evidence. So although we're an inquisitorial process, mm -hmm. a lot of the, in the inquiry or the investigation is done uh, on the papers outside of court. But sometimes there's a dispute in the factual nature of the evidence or it's a highly um, public pub um, profile public interest case that will require witnesses to be called and evidence to be analysed and tested um, by various interested parties. Uh -huh. So they're the types of cases that will generally be heard at an inquest. So when it comes to court, what are you actually looking into? What are you investigating? Mm, well, what, what the coroner is required to find under the Coroner's Act are three basic things. The first is the identity of the person who's died. Mm -hmm. The second is their cause of death. And the third is the circumstances of death. And so that's when there's an investigation into um, what were the facts surrounding those circumstances, because in effect, the coroner is investigating what are the facts. And um, an important part of the coroner's role is prevention. Is uh -huh. there anything about this death that was preventable that can then have a flow on effect in the future to reducing the number of preventable deaths? Uh -huh. So you can make recommendations Absolutely, that this. Absolutely, that's right. Ah, yes, 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 yeah. And is that like the bollards that are up? 
at, in Burke Street or in the city now. Is that is that a recommendation from the I, coronal? That actually didn't arise as a result ah, of a coronal right. um, recommendation, but it's interesting. I think they've uh, emerged as a result of um, motor vehicles being used in ways previously unexpected in respect of public safety. Yes, yes, yes. So. What sort of witnesses do you actually call on during an inquest? Well, usually before an inquest occurs, there's careful consideration given to the scope. So there's a number of often directions hearings and the scope will determine what are the issues within the fact situation that need to be forensically examined. Mm -hmm. So that then has a flow on effect as to the witnesses who are called. So more often than not, if there's an issue in respect of what the cause of death is or generally to set the scene of the case, the first witness is often the forensic pathologist uh -huh, who's conducted yeah. the autopsy or investigation initially into the death and prepared a medical examiner's report. Um, then in terms of determining who the witnesses are, might well be family members, might be treating doctors in a hospital, uh, it might be people who have um, cared for the person involved. It really just depends on the scope. But often there'll be a lot of professional witnesses uh -huh. who will give evidence, whether they've given expert reports or the like. Um, and the purpose of them giving evidence is that so the court can hear that evidence on oath or affirmation, but then they can be asked questions or cross-examined about the evidence that they're providing. Right. And at the end of it, can you send someone to jail or can you... No. <laughs> well, where's the satisfaction? <laughs> Well, in fact, it's, um, it's a greater satisfaction in a sense because um, the coronial process is an investigative one where we're fact-finding. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, a criminal proceeding is very different where charges are laid against a person and it's, um, they're laid by the police and mm -hmm. the test is whether or not um, someone is guilty on the um, beyond reasonable doubt, whereas in the coroner's jurisdiction, we have to answer those three things that I told you about, yes. identity, cause of death and circumstances. And so when, when we don't have the jurisdiction to be um, finding someone guilty or sending someone to jail, although if the coroner forms the view that an indictable offence has occurred, we can certainly refer that refer elsewhere uh -huh. for further investigation by another body. <laughs>